I remember being in New York, <clears throat> New Jersey, and at a Fresh Press concert came to town. And I still didn't know that Eric was Easy E. I didn't even know about NWA. I was in the military, you know what I mean? And it was hard to get you know new music and, and the boonies and stuff in the military, move from state to state. So I remember going to this concert. I was stationed in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and I wound up going to Philadelphia to the Spectrum to see the concert. It was maybe 45 minutes away from New Jersey. And I go to the concert, you know, back in the days in the military, you had to keep the military uniform on when you went to the city, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had my fatigues on, and we got to the concert, and we all went in a bunch. And, you know, we took the bottom of my heads, and I heard, you know, this, this group in WA out of Compton. I let everybody know, I'm from Compton, who could this possibly be? You know, so I'm thinking of like, you know, the LA Dream Team, who all those kind of like hits, they were big, but I didn't know the difference between the hip hop and gangster rap. I didn't know the difference because we never heard of people cussing on records. So when, uh, you know, when NWA came on stage, where they was dressed, they were like I used to dress on the West Coast, you know, you know, and uh, when I start hearing, you know, Easy, we want Easy. I called my little cousin them on the phone while I was at the concert. Man, who was this Easy E and up? Yeah, he said, that's Eric. I'm like, Eric, who is it? Eric's on the corner. I said, what you mean? He said, yeah, he's Easy E now, man. He a multi millionaire. I broke towards the stage. <laughs> and by me going over Eric, you know, he recognized me because I did walk, walk up to the stage in the military uniform. And he did acknowledge me on stage, and then he got me. Uh, Got me as close as backstage as I could possibly get, and he asked me, you know, what was I doing? You know, in this military. I thought I went to the army and stuff, because we didn't see each other for a while. You know, he was doing his thing. I was, we was always homeboys, but we, you know, you might not see a homeboy for two or three years. You know, you could be around the block with each other, you know, but I had, you know, got on it. You know, at that point when I seen my homeboy, my little homeboy on stage, rocking these people, and people singing their songs that I didn't even never heard of, you know, kind of astounded me and blew my mind, man. Starting up, uh, Ruthless became Easy and JJ Fad. And after JJ Fad knocked their album out, we brought uh, Michelle A and the DOC. Did a few tours with the DOC. Then we went to uh, London, came back. Above the Law was with us. Cocaine. It was a, a trip that happened in a little of no time. He's just sprung so fast and NWA just exploded. As a whole ruthless tour, it's gonna be NWA, DOC, Above the Law, and Yo More Marquis. These were the acts on Ruthless Records at the time. Um, and Michelle A. I don't know if y'all remember that R&B stuff, but that, you know, Michelle A. She from way back in the Red and Crew days too. She's been around with Dre since, forever since. And, uh, it was going to be a huge, huge tour. And at this time, the biggest record was the DOCs, you know, one can do it better. And Doc is riding high on that. He's riding real high on that. And one night, Doc got into an accident, a car accident, went through the windshield of a Mercedes Benz, fucked up his vocal cords. So, uh, you know, now when y'all hear him talk, he got to talk like this. That was from that accident. Subsequently, that accident, kind of threw a monkey wrench into everything because Doc couldn't go on tour. Uh, Rufus wasn't going to go on tour without Doc. We had to see him in the hospital and pay for all that. So it really kind of threw a monkey wrench into the tour. So I didn't really get the tour. So nobody really heard of Yo More Marquis until 91 when I put out the album Art Experience. Easy and Ren were the mob, were the men that would stand up to their name. They were thugs, thugsters, you know, they had thug love. And if you threw up your signs, easy, and they would get busy with you. And I let them do what they wanted until it got out of hand. And then I'd break up the fight and, and, you know, take on and take care of them as they used to. The rest of the the rest of the guys, like your uh, your uh, Hollywood gangster, Ice Cube. Ice Cube was never a fighter. I don't think he learned anything about fighting until he started reading his own plays. And Dre, Dre wasn't a fighter as well. Dre was. Dre was a lover. Yellow. Yellow, I was just a nasty guy. Yellow just believed it. <laughs> believed it screwing women and running running in rooms. But uh we had a couple of times where people ran up on Easy and Bobcat ran up on us in San Diego and I didn't know who Bobcat was and I jumped out of the Jeep and 
stuck a gun in his stuck a gun in his face, and he's he had to yell up, no, no, that's he's with us. That was one incident, and then we had a comedian that went on tour with us, and he didn't like the fact that my security, Andre, were kick, kicking him off the stage, and he talked about he's going to have a Andre whooped. And at that point, I asked Atron to give him my ammo case, and when Atron said no, no, he, I opened up my ammo case and stuck my gun in, in the comedian's face and told him, you know, no, ain't nobody gonna hurt NWA or my or my security. Then I took a couple of bullets for uh, DJ Train, which is JJ Fads DJ, and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which was Will Smith. We were doing a show, and somebody's woman got offended by a bitch is a bitch and they told us how they were going to come back and get us and they came back to the hotel in Seattle, Washington and started shooting at a drive-by. So I jumped in front of uh, DJ Train and Will and covered them up and got five bullets in the hand, saved Train and, and, uh, and Will and went out about our business. But for the, for the better half of uh, our tours, we never really had that much trouble. Then after that second N.W.A. album, Niggas for Life, Dre left. Because it was in, inter, uh, intercompany uh, beefs between Dre and Jerry, Easy's manager. And instead of taking, you know, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that Easy took Jerry's side against Dre. I really don't know what happened, tell you the truth. I just know that Dre was unhappy. Uh, he felt like... Jerry was taking money, and then mind you, Cube left NWA after the first album for the same reasons, for the very same reasons. So it might have been some truth to that. And you know, of course, Jerry kept Easy paid, so he was happy. Uh, and, and Easy, Easy was really hurt by that one. Dre came out with with, with that uh, Chronic album and all those videos dissing Eric. And you know, Eric tried to make a slight comeback and you know talk about Dre when he was dressed, you know, in a wrecking crew, looking like Prince with with, with with lipstick and stuff, but you know what? That was the era back then, so it wasn't so much that, you know, Dre and them out there, they, they gay and, and things, things of that nature. It was just that that was kind of the look in the 80s, man. Cube wasn't there too long after I got over there, but Dre was there for a good while. You know, them guys were, were, were really tight. I mean, they were tight. I don't understand how well, I understand how the beef started and things got how it got, but it shouldn't have. But them dudes really loved each other. I mean, when Cube left, I mean, he was upset. But when Dre left, he was really upset. I mean, you, that hurt him on a different level. You know what I mean? It wasn't like when Cube left, you know. But when Dre left, that was like a, a real friend that left. You can see the difference mm -hmm. from the day one. You saw the difference. When Cube left, it was jokes in the studio. It was like that. But when Dre left, he was really, he was hurt. You know, because they were, they were really cool. Uh, I know that it hurt easy. And actually, he really didn't care about Ice Cube because he and Ice Cube weren't, weren't really that close. But Dre was his lifetime friend, and I know that it, you know, it absolutely devastated Easy. You know, when Dre left the company, it devastated him. That was his buddy. Not only was it his buddy, here's the most talented, prolific record producer of the last 22 years. I mean, you can't lose a producer like Dr. Dre and just walk away and say, oh, we're going to be as, as good as ever. I mean, Dr. Dre did the music for every single song up to that time that had ever come out on Rhythms. Once Dre left, you know what I'm saying, and 
they got into it, him and E, you know what I'm saying? That's when me and E, <clears throat> that's when me and E, we had stopped talking for a while because it was like, uh, I was still cool with both of them, you know what I'm saying? And, and I was cool with E, it's like, we just wasn't close no more like we used to be at that time because he wanted me to diss Dre, you know what I'm saying? And, and I was like telling him like, man, I'm not gonna diss Dre. I said, man, because I said, I wouldn't diss either one of y'all. I said, both of y'all like brothers. I said, I ain't gonna diss you with him and I'm not gonna diss him with you, you know what I'm saying? And I know he was hurt for a minute, like, you know, I could tell he was like, cause he was on one, you know what I'm saying? But after all that bullshit boiled over, you know, and I hooked back up with him and did a uh, motherfucking reel. And we was talking about it. He was like, yeah, you was right. You know what I'm saying? He was like, you was right, man. You was right. Because he was finding out a lot of shit at that time. In his own personal life that he didn't know about. So he was like, yeah, that was, he was right. Well, you know, I mean, primarily, you know, our mind state was, was that we got to move on, you know. Um, me being at the helm of everything and, and then being, you know, kind of the, the, the understudy of Dr. Dre, I had to take the reins and, and then just basically, you know, make sure the label had focus. On another, the tone at the label was really just basically, you know, you know, we got enough, you know, we got enough momentum to keep going. You know, I, I think it, I think it kind of went bad when it became Eric's fault that, you know, why everything happened, but that's what happens when you're a leader. I just think the way it went down was really messed up because what I saw that it, it, it hurt Easy because Easy felt like, you know, he helped a lot of people, a lot of us, you know. In it, I think it it, 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 had, it took a toll on him because he were, he was closer to all of the guys from NWA than he was the new guys, you know, the, like, you know, us and, you know, you had Shaky, you had all these different new people around us that, we, you know, we were writing and producing for him. And he didn't have, you know, Ren and Cube and Dre and all these people around. So the climate for him, I think, was kind of, he was kind of lonely and just, you know, with learning with learning us, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and wanting to trust what we were trying to do and take his career to the to that level or even just keep momentum in his career. I, and, and I just think it was because of, the familiarity that he had with the rest of his group and everything and then he got thrusted into something new but he the thing that the climate at the label it didn't really change as much as people think because like we went on and you know we end up doing like black black mafia life at the time and you know what i'm saying and then he he went on and he ended up doing um um i guess it was uh it's on 187 dr dre um and then um, we did Uncle Sam's Curse. So the label was kind of had a focus, and then we signed Bone, you know, shortly after that. But in that time with the, the beef type of situation, it was kind of like, you know, everybody kind of that were together as a family kind of went every direction and aired out their dirty laundry of how they felt about, you know, the head figures or who here, and, you know, everybody kind of just got, got off, you know. You know, and was it healthy? No, it wasn't because at the end of the, at the end of the day, a lot of people said a lot of shit that didn't even know what the fuck was going on. You know what I mean? And a lot of people should have left well enough alone. You know, so because I think at the end of it and the demise of everything, you know, as far as easy, everybody felt like they did it for the wrong reasons. You know what I mean? Everybody broke camp for the wrong reasons, and nobody ever really worked out everything that they wanted to work out. You know, and don't get don't don't get me wrong. I think everything runs its course. I think everybody grow out of each other. I think I just think people have to be man man enough to sit down as men and say, hey, this is what I want. This is what I want to do, and that wasn't done. You know, so the climate at the label, I think, with Eric was, he basically got left hanging. You know, he got left hung out to dry. But we kept moving. We kept pushing. We never really, we never really wanted to like have issues with with Dre, you know. I think that when they did Death Row, they more so wanted to have issues with us, more so to use it as a catalyst to build what they were trying to build. I think, you know, that's what I truly believe because it's kind of what happened. You know, a lot of the biting went on. You know, people left with ideas they shouldn't have left with, and you know, all kinds of stuff. And I think that was a tact. I think that was a tactic to kind of downplay us. 
you know, the people who stayed down with Easy and versus really just throw him off of his point, you know. But Easy was a sharp enough businessman to say, hey, we got to keep moving. And, you know, we're going to strike back. We're going to keep moving, you know. He understood about the label thing, you know. And plus, before that, you got to realize he had went through some back and forth stuff with, with um, Cube. So it kind of didn't really affect him as far as the business is concerned. I just think he felt like, you know, abandoned, you know, at that time. Because he felt like, you know, i done everything I could do to keep you at, pl at, at play, but you still got something to say about me. You know, so. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I am a hip hop producer, hip hop music producer in the group Madness for Real. I've been producing ever since 1986. And um, I've been producing predominantly hip hop, gangster rap. After a couple of years, we hooked up with, uh, with our current manager at the time. He was a Danish dude, but he um, he had a business where he took over U.S. rap acts and uh, did concerts with them. People like EPMD and Queen Latifah and stuff like that. And he had um, he had a hookup to a guy called Dave Funkenklein. Dave Funkenklein was based out in L.A. and he was working on at that time a Disney-related record label called Hollywood Basic. Um, he knew about us and he actually hooked us up with uh, our very first uh, project. And Dave was so, uh, Dave Funkenklein was so, uh, he thought that we, uh, we had something, we had some potential. So he hooked us up with a street promoter for Ruthless Records um, called Doug Young. Doug Young later on also worked for, he's a legendary street promoter in LA. Um, he worked for uh, Death Row amongst others after he uh, worked with uh, Ruthless. And he knew that Dre at the time had just left Easy to go and work with with uh, Shook on on Death Row Records, or and then he knew that Easy needed beats. So um, he called us up and was like, "Listen, I can try and see if I can place your beats with Easy." And we sent him some beats, and um, Easy was hooked. He was interested. He wanted to work. So, uh, and Easy, he was, uh, he was a guy that, that didn't just talk about it, he acted on it. So, uh, he sent us our tickets and said, come to LA and work with me. So, um, we packed our bags and in 1992, um, we stood at LAX and, uh, was ready to work. And, uh, first meeting Easy was, I mean, that was the first time I was really starstruck. Easy was, uh, he was a funny type. This little dude with this huge charisma. He um, he was very cool, very down to earth, but you can still tell that he was something special. Um, he was he was funny in many ways. I mean, I remember back in the days he only had like white cars, and I remember in his white cars he had debt tapes at the time. At the time that was like crazy. I've never seen debt tapes in in vehicles. Um, and not even ever since. 5150, this was a, um, a record we put out in, in um, December of one year. It came out, actually it came out like in January and um, it, it, was, it was a real crazy record. That's the one with Neighborhood Sniper on it. Um, and um, Only If You Want It, um, and Naughty By Nature produced on that too. You know what I mean? So that this is, all this stuff is after, after Dre left. So, you know, we still was placking. So. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> but Easy, he was he was ready. He uh, he was ready to work, and uh, he placed us over at um, at a studio in Torrance called Audio Achievements, where he basically started his ruthless um, empire. Where he uh, before we came had had used the studio for he block booked the studio for many years with this legendary um, engineer called Donham and the Dirt Biker Smith. And um, we came in and started working right away. And um, our first task with Easy was to produce. He actually came in to us and said, listen, I need a Christmas song. And we said, Christmas song? You sure? You want a Christmas song? Yeah, and uh, I want a Christmas song and I want you to incorporate at least 20 Christmas songs within the production but you can't sample. 
you have to play everything. So our first task, and it was me um, and some of my partners from Madness Real and our colleague also from Denmark called Dr. Jam, we started doing this and I mean it was, we couldn't fathom that Easy had asked us to sit there and do Christmas music with gangbangers. That was for us hard to understand how that came up, that, that, what that idea was, was good for. But we did the track and, um, and Easy invited everybody from Ruthless um, to come and join them on this track. I mean, we were talking about Little Rascals, we were talking about Benicia Twa, um, we were talking about uh, Adnan Clan, who later on became Black Eyed Peas, um, and a bunch of group, of, huge group of people that was, uh, that was on the track. And um, the track came out fat, and I mean, that's a, it's a Christmas song that we, we listen to every year, and I actually hear that they, they be playing the shit out of it around Christmas in L.A. So that's, uh, I guess that's our legacy as well. Yeah, well, when I was little growing up, Easy came out in like 86 with the song Boys in the Hood and Dope Man. So when that became popular, I'm from Compton, I grew up in Compton, in between Compton and Washington, these are the only two cities I ever lived in. So when I was little, we heard that song, I was probably about 10 years old maybe 11 years old when I heard that song you know everybody started playing it around in the city or whatever and shit it became popular and then right after that I started trying to rap too you know what I mean I never knew Easy I always knew where he lived at where he was from and stuff like that but I didn't meet him up until 93 and what actually happened was some dudes was supposed to help him start a label what was supposed to help him start Ruthless Records actually some, some other cast a dude named uh Big Daddy Pat and a dude named Jim Bob, they from Watts too. I grew up in the projects right here in the Jordan Downs where uh, Big Daddy Pat is from. And I guess later throughout the years, he heard me and my brother Drayster was rapping. So he came on my street one day and was like, man, I heard y'all rapping or whatever. He was like, yeah, you know? So he was like, well, man, we gonna take y'all to the studio. So when he took us to the studio, it happened to be easy in the studio. And it's the same studio where they recorded all the NWA albums where they recorded uh, Michelle A's album, JJ Fad, all the groups that came out in the Ruthless. And when we went in the studio, Easy put us in the booth and told us to rap, and we got in the booth, started spitting. Next thing you know, he put some beats on, and we started recording music, and it just happened like that. I had a little issue with Easy, like, at the time that I met him, and it was right after the little Rodney King thing happened. And uh, I seen Easy on TV, with the, one of the police who beat up Rodney King, but he was the one who actually turned the other cops in, you know what I mean? And uh, Easy went down there and supported him, downtown LA or whatever. So I wrote a rap actually dissing him, you know what I mean? I had a rap dissing him. So when we got to the studio, Pat and Jim Bob was like, man, this nigga got a rap dissing him. So Easy told me to say the rap, and I, I said the rap to him, and he just laughed, like, you know what I mean? But after that, he just, what he did was, he was like, uh, he said, uh, I'm going to smoke you out. So he got a gang of weed. He wrote up like 20 joints or whatever. So he made me, he said, I'm going to smoke half. You got to smoke the other half, and we're going to see who can smoke the most. We got to like seven joints, and I couldn't hang no more. So he, out, he outdid me and shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was always, you know, when I first got around him, I was just like starstruck a little bit because I was like, damn, this little motherfucker I've been admiring my whole life trying to, you know, actually walk in his footsteps, you know what I mean? But it was all good though. The best part about directing videos for, for Easy was, uh, well, so much was great. It was going into Ruthless Records, sitting with Jerry at Easy, at Easy's office, uh, throwing ideas out. You know, Jerry's super, hardcore, uh, really pretty straightforward guy and, and a powerful man. To be sitting with that, him and, and Easy and some of the crew, I just felt so honored to be on that couch. Uh, to be in that, to be driving in there and to do so many videos for Ruthless, uh, to work with this, these great groups, to work with Above the Law and Ren, Cocaine, oh, what a great guy. And shoot all those videos in all those locations. Um, and, and to be, I was so honored to direct Real Motherfucking G's. And I'm, I'm so grateful I knew him.
Uh, I'm so sorry he's he's gone. It's it's. After I did my first video with Easy, uh, he said, "Marty, you're doing all my videos," and I didn't realize that he was serious. And the next one we did was Above the Law, VSOP, and then Call It What You Want. It's 187, you know, I'm chilling at my video. It's fat, it's mega, it's all that's proper, you know what I'm saying? Well, I know what you're be. saying. It's the whole pot of gumbo, the whole Rufus gallon of juice. family in the house. Yeah, Rufus on the Little Abraham. Abraham. Come in, move forward. Yeah, you, come on. Little Abraham, what up? He said, yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, 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 you. crazy, come get forward. wild. Tell him what's up, Rick. Kiss my black ass. And when we were working with Tupac, uh, Easy, very hands-on. He's he's watching the monitor with me, and uh, he's I can tell he's really liking how call it what you want was. We had Tretch and Stretch there. We had Digital Underground. Uh, we had Money B and uh, uh, Red was there, and it was it was just a, a great experience. Just all the Ruthless Records people were there, uh, and I remember Easy leaning over to me saying. Marty, one day you're gonna be somebody. It ain't today though. <laughs> I think that was a compliment. I mean, like when I met Eric in the beginning, he, he wanted me to play some more records in here, so then they brought more records. And that's how we developed that relationship. And so I played like, after Boys in the Hood, then I played like Dope Man, and then I was playing like Panic Zone, and, and uh, what other records I was playing in here? I played uh, like, when, or like, um, uh, uh, Easy Does It, Radio, when those came out, he, he came and brought those, you know what I mean? He was he was on top of his game, or, or he had somebody bring the records, you know what I mean? So I, I, I worked with him through those, you know, that relationship was there through, through that time, and then later on, uh, K-Day was over, the radio station was over. Later on, he came some years later and wanted us to get back on the radio at 92.3 The Beat. And that's how he, he first came over, because he wanted to sign Kid Frost. Uh, we had an album. First came over, now that I remember. He first came over because Greg Mack brought him over to our house. Greg Mack was working at his label. I guess he was helping him with some stuff. So he said, you should come over and see Tony, Tony and Julio. So he came to our studio and he was working with a group called HWA. And when he came to our studio, I had the dat of Kid Frost's album that had been shelved at Virgin Records. We had been dealing with Virgin, they weren't, they weren't cooperating, we couldn't get nothing done with them. They were just holding our record up. So I played it for Easy, and I remember him sitting there listening to it. And like, he had no expression. Like, he just sat there, and in my head I was like, damn, should I even have played this for him? Because I just thought like, this is Latino style rap. This ain't this, this even this dude's trip. Like, what am I even playing? After like the third song, I felt like, damn, why did I even put this on? Because he wasn't making no expression. He was just listening to it like this. Not smiling, not fiddling with none, just standing there like And I was like, wow, I guess, like, you know, whatever. I let a couple more songs play. Whatever, I forgot about it. And about a, about a week later, not even a week later, maybe like three days later, he calls me and he goes, hey, let me, let, let me holler at Julio, you know what I mean? Hey, what's going on, man? He goes, how much you want for that album? I'm like, for what album? He's 